So today I would like to talk about Kotlin and uh, Java interoperability. We, I feel like in the first impression, maybe everyone thinks like, uh, what can be, we can learn something new more about like in this interoperabilities uh, features and um, what can be new, right? So I thought to do, but before I got a very huge application and uh, right now uh, all this new modern um, architecture, which is modular architecture where like you can work on uh, separate models where you, you can have um, different features in different models and they work independently when you are teammates, right? And if we imagine that uh, you have a very huge application which was written in Java, but now the business solution of business requirements like don't rewrite everything what was written in Java, but continue to work on, on Kotlin, so adding up on top of the uh, Java code, Kotlin code, and uh, keep continuing on it, right? Uh, there is a no problem because uh, we, you can follow this modular architecture and whatsoever. But, uh, and then because uh, Kotlin was started to implement after Java, uh, we we have a lot of uh, tools like converting Java to Kotlin. So it means like if we are writing something in Kotlin, and because it's new language, uh, newer language, and the, the Kotlin was developed to be inter operable with Java. Uh, it has a lot of like cool functions, like for example, in Android Studio, we have this converting Java to Kotlin with one click or something like that. But because uh, maybe some new features or new things that uh, you have implemented in Kotlin, you need to connect it from Java side. For example, like uh, in, um, in modular uh, application, what well, do you follow this modular architecture? So you have written something new, cool, or something base in Kotlin, but uh, for uh, and uh, your feature which was written in Java doesn't have it. So how are you going to access that? So that was for me the challenging part, some interesting part that I've learned uh, connecting Java uh, Kotlin code from Java, right? So here, uh, what can help you? It's uh, first of all there are very useful. Uh, Annotations. So first of all, um, we can talk about uh, Java JVM name architecture. Wait, uh, annotation. Sorry. And um, here our here I can show that our usual um, function get my example and which is returning the string, right? And in Java, we supposed to have the uh, same. Uh, same understanding when we're calling it, right? Uh, when we compiler understand that. But if we are going to use a Java uh, JVM annotation, uh, we can sometimes uh, rename this kind of uh, functions names. Why do we need that? Uh, for, uh, first of all, um, you may you might have in your local model in Java model the same uh, feature or same <laughs> class or uh, exactly the same name, kind of name, uh, methods and functions. So to uh, to differentiate that, you can use uh, this um, annotation to rename the file name, rename the uh, field name, function name, class name, and what's all over. Um, if in Kotlin, uh, we can use, uh, we can define the uh, collections like that uh, items and items but and we can see that there are two different items because the types are different and uh, in java it can be a problem because uh, usually uh, in java we don't know what kind of collection inside like it's strings or ints so to make sure that um, when we are calling this uh, variables from java um, we can rename that differently so the compiler uh, when we are calling them there won't be any kind of confusions what to use and what to call and then another thing we can talk about uh, when we are uh, calling uh, java jvm name annotation in our fields like country for example when we define um, variable in kotlin we don't need to write this boilerplate code like getters and setters but uh, sometimes um, we need to understand that 
uh, by requirements, we want to rename our uh, uh, getter and the setter name, for example, in Java, because maybe you have in your um, in Java maybe you have uh, get country and set country kind of uh, method, but in Kotlin you are calling country variable and automatically it's going to be get country and set country, so you can differentiate as uh, these methods as well uh, and then name that in Kotlin file. <laughs> And uh, another thing is cool about Kotlin feature, which is um, overloading. So sometimes we can um, um, define the function and the parameters can be default. For example, like uh, we, we can have a lot of default values and it can be like null, false. And here we can say like, if we're sending country, we can the default name of country is Singapore and city is Singapore. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to override it, you can just send the country or city. But Java doesn't understand that this is new cool feature of Kotlin. <laughs> so how are we going to handle that if uh, we are going to call this kind of method uh, from Java class? And um, usually this uh, JVM uh, overloads annotation helps. So. And sometimes we are like, not sometimes like we can use this uh, JVM overloads, not only in functions as in, in constructors as well, because uh, in Java, if we are going to have several constructors, we need to rewrite like a name in constructor. And uh, in the second constructor, we are going to have name and the uh, last name or age and whatsoever. But in Kotlin, we, are, we can write everything in one line <laughs> and define some default val um, values or make it nullable. So let's talk about exceptions. Mm, and uh, when uh, we are writing exceptions in Kotlin, it's uh, very easy. We just define the functions and throw the exceptions if it ha happens. But in Java, we can't do that. We need to uh, define the exceptions when we are defining the method when we are giving a name for the method, right? So uh, that's why uh, to, to make it easier to Java understand the Kotlin uh, code, we need to use thorough annotation. Then uh, when we are compiling it and calling uh, this method from Java class, we immediately and Java class immediately understands this method is going to throw any exception. So and uh, it can be different kind of exception. For example, here's IO exception and um, and uh, read exception and any other exceptions that you can define that. And uh, what is the cool thing <laughs> here in um, uh, Kotlin? I really loved it. It was um, companion object, object, which is like uh, when we are using st static variables, static classes in Java. Uh, it was a little bit different how we used in Kotlin, right? So to differentiate and understand how we are going to use uh, these static classes in Java, how we need to um, define that in our Kotlin class. So we have these two annotations, which is JVM fields and JVM statics. For example, in, in Kotlin, we have component object and, and we have static get country by area functions. And uh, as a constant, I have like uh, Kazakhstan. But uh, by code, we can understand that this is a static class maybe. But after compilation, uh, without any kind of annotation, we can see that it's not getting that as a static class. Uh, it's calling the example class and calling the companion object, which is a wrapper in Kotlin, and call, calling the get country by area and functions, and uh, are using get set methods calling the variable. So, what will change if we are using these annotations? So, when we use these annotations, uh, it immediately understands that uh, get country by, by area functions and the Kazakhstan as a variable are static variables and static uh, functions. And <laughs> another very cool feature everyone loves in Kotlin, it's nullab nullability. But 
we don't have that in Java. Uh, so how we can make sure that Java understands it correctly, it's by using nullable annotations. So for example, uh, if we have this nullable function and calling it from Java without any kind of annotation, um, we can mm -hmm. get an error. Uh, but if we are using nullable, uh, it will not give any error. So we can just directly check if it's null or not null and uh, do with this variable what we want to do or parameter. So uh, in Kotlin, we have a different type of um, keywords. So if um, there are, we can't use as a variable names in Java or in Kotlin, any uh, hard keywords. So in Java, we can't, when we understand that we are working with Java and uh, Kotlin together, in Java, we can't have all these uh, keywords, hard keywords as a parameter name or function name and whatsoever. But as a soft keywords, modifier keywords, maybe we can have them. But um, as a uh, engineer, I would recommend don't use them as well. <laughs> there are so many words and uh, like <laughs> symbols that we can use at. And um, uh, this is my Twitter. And um, I think this is what I have for you today to share. Hopefully it was useful and thank you <laughs> for being with me. So for SDK developers, is there any mm -hmm. suggestions on how to flag down documentation gaps during code reviews to nudge engineers to update function documentations? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that when we are migrating the code uh, between, uh, like, we usually use more migra uh, migration annotation. So everyone understands this is migrated, but uh, for documentations, I, I do believe like I have used only like Java doc annotations that can be automated to document that. But for Kotlin, it's a good question. <laughs> I'll be looking into that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, there's a there's another question as well. So how does Java interpret silk classes and interfaces in Kotlin? Yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> but, uh, well, mostly, um, I, I, I do believe in, with interfaces, uh, there is a no problem that we need mm -hmm. to, like, we can just, uh, it, it's going to be interpreted and inter interface, but with sealed class, I think um, uh, uh, there should be uh, uh, special annotations that we can make sure that it's going to be, uh, it's going to use it properly. So maybe it's a, uh, good topic for our next session that I can look at and prepare for you. <laughs> I'm just going to make a guess here that um, uh, for Silk class, uh, it actually gets compiled down to uh, uh, abstract classes with uh, private constructors and uh, and and the, the different uh, child classes is the implementation of the abstract class. But I, I think that, that's just a guess here <laughs> as to how, how I would think the Kotlin will, will uh, mm -hmm. compile compile this code down to the Java bytecode. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but I think it, it should be interesting to, to look further. So we have another question. So for code bases with uh, Java and Kotlin code, uh, which documentation framework do we use? Uh, um, I, I've i never used Docker previously. We were using only Java doc. So um, as like Julie asked previously, I think this is a good topic that we can look deeper and research deeper yeah <laughs> <laughs> cool cool yeah usually i just uh write my uh comments in just like you know the double slash or, or the usual java doc style you know? yeah. <laughs> right um ah uh, yes company hiring. <laughs> yeah we are hiring we are hiring a lot please uh it doesn't matter which location you are in now, right now. <laughs> Please feel free to reach me out, and we are hiring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone is hiring everywhere. <laughs> Do you know how to use the JVM in nine? Can, uh, uh, can, uh, can can you show? Um, um, I think that uh, the sealed class interfaces and this uh, JVM in nine is a good topic for my next session, maybe. <laughs> <After a few laughs> Thank you mm -hmm. for question, Manish. <laughs> 